Γεια σας μπουμπουκάκια. Αν μπορείτε παιδιά πείτε μου αν με ακούτε. Γεια σας, γεια σας. Πείτε μου αν ακούγομαι. Παρακαλώ. Τέλεια. Σούπερ. Δεν θα χορέψουμε, Νίκο. Θα χορέψουμε από εβδομάδα πάλι. Σήμερα θα μιλήσουμε. Δώστε μου πέντε λεπτάκια, ούτε πέντε, να βάλω μέσα και τον Τζαμάλ και μετά θα αρχίσω να σας μιλάω στο αγγλικά. Ποιο στη χάρη σας. Όποια παιδιά βαριούνται να περιμένουν δύο λεπτά, μπορούν να μπουν σε δύο λεπτάκια. Γιάννη, στα γαλλικά δεν μπορώ να στα πόντρια από με. <laughs> λοιπόν, πριν ξεκινήσουμε και πριν έρθει και ο Τζαμάλ, ε, το σημερινό live είναι λιγάκι για την ballroom σκηνή και το voguing. Γεια σας κύριε Στέριο, μας έχετε λείψει πάρα πολύ. Ε, και hello Daniel, hello Risto. Α, ah, this is my father right there. I'm gonna let him in. So, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, bro? I'm trying to wake up in the morning, eat, remind myself to train. It's hard for me. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> With everything going on, right? How's the weather over there? It's kind of rainy. Yeah, it's kind of rainy over here, too, a little bit. And it's not helping, really. But we're trying to do our best, and they just announced that we have to... Stay indoors in the lockdown for three more weeks. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, so it's fun. <laughs> you by yourself? Or you have family there? Right? Yes, I am actually with my cat. She's here. Yes. <laughs> so um, I wanted to do this live because there are many uh, dancers from the dance community, and there are many people from the queer and LGBT community that have been interested in voting. And I think it's a nice occasion, now that we're all home, to talk about stuff like that. And you were the perfect person to do that and give us all the information. And so I would like to start, we have 22 questions open. Um, and I have divided them in groups. Um, we have one hour, okay. so we have to make it like short okay. as possible, because the last questions are the juiciest ones, so okay. we have to get them. Yeah. <laughs> so the first group of questions is uh, history of voguing and ballroom. Okay. And the question is, how did balls start, who organized them, and where they were hosted at? So... Now, what I'm about to say to you is based on my experience and based on my knowledge. You know, people yeah, sure. speak to other people and they might tell them different things from their point of view. But I'm just going off of what I know from the people that I've asked who are my elders, I guess you could mm -hmm. say. Um, so from what I understand, the house ball structure, um, the scene started in 1972 and it started with Uh, Pepe La Beja and the House of La Beja, that was like the biggest house um, when the house ball scene first started. Um, shortly after that, you had the House of Decree, you had the House of Ninja, and you had the House of Pendavas, just to name a few, but that's how the house ball started. 
um, the actual throwing of balls, um, I believe it started from Paris back in the late 70s. Uh, she had a ball, and I believe it was called um, April in Paris. Um, mm -hmm. But back in the, in the late 70s, the, most of the balls back then were basically femme queen or femme based. It wasn't really a butch queen era. Um, it wasn't until the late 70s and the early 80s is when um, Paris at this uh, ball that she had, that the April, uh, April in Paris, was when she introduced Butch Queen categories for the first time. And it was, um, I believe it was Butch Queen, Face, Realness, and Models Effect. Um, okay. Those were the first type of Butch Queen categories that they had back then. Okay. So... So I would say Paris Dupree started actually throwing the balls, but as far as the houses being cultivated and that house, the house ball scene starting with a group of different houses, I would say it started from Peppa and the House of Liberation. Okay. So um, when did we start using the phrase tens across the board and how did the, was this phrase created? So I... From what I've always remembered, we've always used numbers. The same way when you go to the Olympics and when you see competitions, they have a number system. Um, yeah. It's the same with the balls. So today when we see balls, we see the tens and the chops. But back in the day, we used to get numbers. So you could probably get a five, a six, a seven, or an eight, and the highest would be the ten. And okay. after you got scored, they would tally up the scores, and that's how they would give you your trophy. And also back then, we also had two trophies. So you could win grand prize and you could also win first place, which I thought was really, really special because it gave people the opportunity to not only win grand prize, but you could also walk away from something as yeah. far as first place is concerned, you know? Okay. Um, so movies and documentaries that people can watch to get educated about voguing and ballroom. So I would say, of course, Paris is burning. Um, I was a part of How Do I Look, so I would say How Do I Look as well. Um, okay. I don't really know that many other um, documentaries that are specific to ballroom. I know that um, there are different individuals who are a part of the ballroom culture. For example, we have people in Paris and we have people um, abroad who are doing, let will just say like theses of ballroom. So they have materials that they're working on that they have online or that's available to the public. It's just a matter of, I guess, reaching out to or making a post in the ballroom worldwide group and just okay. seeing who's out available, like what artists are available, if they have any you know, films that they could watch. I saw a, a good film by uh, Stefan uh, Omni uh, back when I was in uh, Amsterdam for the Omni Ball. So that was really good. And it was an independent film by himself. That's very interesting. So that we can make a post at Ballroom International. Right. If you, I would suggest, you know, mm -hmm. in the Ballroom Worldwide group, because I think a lot of us are in there. Um, or yeah. you in other groups as well that you think they have a lot of people. And just ask who's working on documentaries or who's um, working on theses or studies for the ballroom scene. And pair with some of your peers. And they might be able to give you information on ballroom or questions that you might have. Perfect. I will ask you about pose at the other group of questions. Okay. <laughs> I also wanted to go back to another question you asked me when you asked about who started it. I want everyone to know that the ballroom scene started in New York. It, okay. New York is the mecca of where it all started. Um, so you told us about the most important category already. Say it again the most important categories at the first balls. Can you rephrase it? Like the categories that were the first introduced in the balls? Um, so I don't know the first categories that were introduced because like I said before, they were mostly femme queen categories and for female figures. So I guess if you spoke to a female figure from back in the day, maybe Leah Richards, um, she's somebody who you could probably speak with. Maybe she could give you more insight. I know from a butch queen perspective, it's the category that I mentioned, face, the realness and the models effect. I know for butch queen face, the first person to walk was Erskine Christian. He was, he's like the mecca when it comes to the butch queen face category. Um, when it comes to realness, as far as I'm concerned, it was Larry Ebony. He's 
the mecca when it comes to or like the mother or the father or if you want to give like to these categories um i don't really know who was the first when it comes to models effect because it was so many people that i've heard throughout the years but i do know it was pioneers like devin um our our chanel um pe people like that um that used to walk those categories and i think william dupree i'm not mistaken but those are the people pioneers i would say i don't know who the one person was in that particular category okay so we're done with the history questions and now we're going to the personal questions that concern you jamal milan and it was wait how did you decide to open the greek chapter of the house of milan and what is your goal you said how or how did you decide to open the greek chapter okay so i love greece when i first went to greece i've always loved greece and the house of milan i'm the overseer for the house of milan both internationally and american so my job as far as i'm concerned is i'm looking to always expand the house of milan i'm always looking to branch out into new areas areas a lot of houses have not even began so when i went to greece i had already known some people in greece before i got there but when i got there and i met the people that i you know recruited to join the house of milan and when i saw the ballroom scene i just felt that there was a need because greece is so new and because greece is an is a young uh ballroom scene i wanted to be a part of it and try to help it as much as i can and when i saw that there was so much talent there and there was really not much ballroom representation in greece i said hey why not you know, see talented people i got to know them they're they're very lovely people on top of that i can see the growth and the potential in them why not bring them to the house of milan they fit the same mold we have the same mindset so why not bring them to the house of milan and in the process build a uh, uh, a chapter in greece because like everything you know once ballroom is expanding and i am just proud to say that the house of milan is the first american house in greece that we can start off with along with the house of cariola so that we can bridge any gaps that are there so that you guys can slowly begin to have balls together and just let the scene grow and let the people in greece know that they have an outlet if they have um if they want to be a part of the scene period you know i think a lot of times there are places where it's only one representative of a house and that's fine but i think when you have other houses there it shows competition it gives people an option to do other things it takes away from anybody monopolizing anything because the ballroom scene is our scene it's not one it does not belong to one person it belongs to everybody so and i think that i am pretty was respected enough to and well liked enough to be the one to try to bridge those gaps and to help Greece become one of the biggest and the most prosperous scenes in the ballroom scene so i'm very excited about Greece i was very excited when i got there and i saw the people how they cheer for each other i uh, i went to the practices um there as well i went to lunch and 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 dinners and hung out with people in Greece you know so i i really feel a connection with not only the people who are Milans in Greece but also people who i've made friendships with in Greece and i believe that they believe that i would not steer them wrong and again my goal is just to i has always been to live forever and the way that i live forever is by spreading love and knowledge through gold or through ballroom history so that's my that goal. was beautiful <laughs> I miss you so much. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um yeah, so your experience while well, being a choreographer at the Pose series. Okay. Is there anything you can share with us regarding the upcoming season? I'm not sure if this is top secret or not. And are we going to see any Milan's uh dancing at the next season? Well, if I told you we would see Milan, that's selling secrets, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, so what I can say is that um, season three, as with anything, you try to get better, right? Everyone's trying to get better and they're trying to improve. And I can definitely say that the work that we're doing, they try so hard. Like they really, really are putting in the effort. 
you know, this is my first time being in an experience where I'm working behind the scenes with actors to see them prepare for their roles. So it's very yeah. interesting to see how dedicated they are to what they're trying to do. And, you know, we talk on a one-on-one -on -one basis behind the scenes and I consider them cool acquaintances, you know what I mean, and, and friends. So I think that people are gonna be excited to see some of the things that they do this year as what they did last year. They played more so on uh, Vogue Fem last year, but I think this year they're gonna do more exciting things. We'll just say that. Okay. And when is it gonna air? Uh, well, you know, it was supposed to air in April, but because of everything that's going on in the world, you know, everything is on hold. So I don't know how many episodes they've already filmed or okay. if it's going to wait until it's safe for everybody to begin to be out and about this way. They don't have to start episodes and then pause them and leave fans hanging or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited. Of course. And actually, Pose is uh, one of the like, most, I would say, reliable sources when it comes to learning about voguing. And many people who are not in the ballroom scene or who have not had the chance to talk to someone from the ballroom scene, they get like a small connection to it and they start searching about it. Right. They do. And I think, wait, so how did you start voguing and who was your influence and your mentor when you started dancing and voguing? So I started, well, first of all, when I was younger, I was always athletic. I was always athletic. I was, I was a freestyle dancer in high school and I loved to dance. Um, I was, throughout the years, I trained in martial arts and I became a brown belt in martial arts. So when I saw um, dancing, um, voguing, you know, and I've always been a fan of break dancing. I've always loved break dancing, but the only trouble that I had was I could never do the, the windmill, you know, things in their hands. And I didn't have anyone <laughs> around me at that time to teach me how to do that. So when I went to a ball, I was very young, like 17, 18 years old, now, but I went to the ball and I saw the, the Vogue, I, I saw a pop, dip and spin on the flyer. And I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that it had to be some type of dance. And I knew what voguing was because my uh, gay mother at the time, who was also my high school uh, classmate, was also voguing. And I liked what, what he was doing, but I really couldn't tell what it was. So when I got to the first ball I went to was the extravaganza ball. And when I saw Jose and them voguing coming down these like bleacher steps, I thought it was awesome. But that was only the beginning. That was the extravaganza Grand March. So when Pop, Tip, and Spin came and the beat dropped and every, everybody started coming from, somebody was coming from under the table, somebody was coming from down the steps, somebody was cartwheeling, and everybody was doing different moves, but they were sort of similar. But everyone yeah. had such a precision and a pop. Every, everybody had like a, a pop to them. And when I saw that, and then I saw them getting on their necks, and I was like, oh, wow, this is almost like karate and break dancing at the same time. So the, like when I saw the different styles, because don't forget, I only saw my classmate's style. I thought it was the best. When I saw everybody else's style, I immediately fell in love with this guy named Jerome Pendarvis. I consider him the human Spider-Man because he could just do all type of amazing things with his body. That's where I get a lot of my sharpness from. Um, I also took to Jason Overness. He was very graceful with the way he did his voguing. And another person I took to was Jared Princess. He okay. mostly vogued around his face. And I thought it was very interesting that somebody could vogue around their face only. And all of their movements was accenting their face. And I just thought that that was so difficult to do because most people can vogue, it's fine. You can vogue, you can do all type of elements, but concentrating on your face and concentrating on accenting your face I thought was so difficult so I immediately took to him and he was also from New Jersey so me and him started hanging out together and he taught me how to face and perform and he taught me how to build my arm strength up how to box my face then I met uh, Floyd uh, Ebony who was a, a Milan eventually and he taught me how to have attitude in the ballroom scene not to be uh, fearful of anybody to be fearless and always to be the first one out 
um, to show people that you're not bothered. And um, but I all I always if I anybody had to ask me, I would say it was Floyd, it was Jared, and it was definitely Jerome Pendarvis and Jason Ogness. Those are the four people who I looked at. And I like back then you didn't have anything to watch. All you could do was see people when you saw them out. So I just would study them and watch them and then go home and try to practice it. And I was practicing at work. I was practicing at home. I was practicing when I'm walking. <laughs> I was practicing in long hallways. I just wanted to learn how to vote because I just, I've always been the type of person to strive for excellence in everything that I do. So when I wanted to learn how to vote, I was like, oh, I got to be the best. Like, I, there's no way. I'm a brown belt. So how can I go from being a brown belt in this activity and then I'm going to learn how to vote and I'm going to be trash? And that's not, you know. And, and in karate, so much pressure. <laughs> this is what martial arts and it teach you how to overcome, over, overcome things. So that's also been my drive. And then when I saw Michael Jordan playing basketball and how spectacular he was, I just resonated with him. And I just said to myself, if I'm going to be in this ballroom scene, it's going to be a ballroom Hollywood for me. Who would I be in Hollywood? Like, who would I look at in Hollywood and say I wanted to be like? And the first thing that came to mind is Whitney Houston, because I love Whitney Houston. But that's from a singing aspect. I look at voguing as dancing like a sport. Um, so I said, if I was going to be anybody in ballroom, it would have to be some type of sports figure or something. So back then, I was in love with basketball and the finesse that he had and the achievements he made. Every time he won a ring, I tried to do the same thing with winning of the year. And like all oh, the shit. that he did, I tried to do the same thing in ballroom. So I, you know, I, I modeled myself after his career, but from a ballroom perspective, if that's what if that, yeah. And I think of ballroom as, like I said, it's Hollywood, but when it comes to houses, I think that we're teens. I think that you become a team first, and by way of being a team and by competing, that's how you become a family by fellowshipping with one another. Okay. Yeah. So, let me see where we are. We were talking about who influenced me with balls, voguing. So, yes. So, what does belonging in a house and being a father mean to you? How do you interpret these phrases? Well, belonging in a house, like I said before, is it starts off with a lack of, with an interest, right? For you see somebody with talent or you're cool with somebody and you see that they have talent to walk balls. Um, being in a house is, is primarily being in a house to walk balls. We, we're in a house to walk balls. I think people need to understand that first. And this is just my opinion and my belief. Through the process of walking balls, you build a fellowship, and that's how you become a family. The same way when you get a job. You go to a job, they're reading your application, they're looking at you in the interview, and they're taking a chance on you based on what you're representing. By you getting that job and you uh, going through different projects and, and, and you know, you're having different experiences, you begin to grow in the job and you begin to become, build fellowships and relationships with people. Then the next thing you know, people say, oh, my job is my family. Well. It starts off by those experiences and things of that nature. So I think, so yeah, that's how I would answer that question. And, what was the and about that? being a father. Being a father to me is everything. I take it very, very seriously. I'm not only a father to my gay kids. I have, I'm a father to other people in other houses as well. And I try to reach out to them at least once every two weeks. Uh, a lot of them, I know their mothers and their fathers. I know their brothers and their sisters. Um, it's based on the relationship. You know, some people are more closed in, where they, they may not um, want to release the information right away, which is fine. But I make sure that I let people know that I'm there for them whenever my kids need me, even if it's in the early in the morning or if I'm in the middle of something, I make time for them. Um, and I that's them. true. <laughs> I confirm yeah, this. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I try to handle things with them outside of ballroom as well as in ballroom. I take it very seriously as far as if they have graduations or um, things in their personal life that they need help with or they need to be cheerleaders. So a lot of times people need to be cheerleaders. And I try to cheer my kids on as much as I can. And I'll fight tooth and nail for them. A lot of times they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I have this problem. 
and I'm immediately on attack mode because I'm very, very protective. I've always been a very protective person. Um, and I'm just that way when it comes to my kids, and I'm also that way when it comes to my moms. You know, as the overseer of this house, I tell them all the time, I will go tooth and nail and fight for you in this house because I believe in this house and I believe in all of you. You wouldn't be in the house if, if, I, if we didn't believe in you. And yeah, I'm a very, oh, I guess I'm an overprotective father. Some people might say that. <laughs> Okay, we love you very much. And you can see it in the comments, like everyone is hearts and- Oh yeah, I can't see the comments. Oh, I don't want to see the comments because I want to focus on the views. I don't want to get distracted. <laughs> So, um, we are going to the third group of questions, okay. which is questions about categories. Okay. Some of them are more technical, okay. and some of them are more like theoretical and discussion about the category. So, we start with the first question. How can we, uh, can we start using a prop in a category and then not use it at the battles? So... If the category calls for with a prop, then to me, you should keep that prop with you the entire time. Okay. Or if you want to be creative, you can take that prop instead of using, so let's say for example, the category calls for performance excalibur with performance with a prop. You can come out with, let's say a chain, right? You're building with the chain. And then for your next battle, you can build with a pole. And then for your next battle, you can vote with knives. And then for mm -hmm. your next battle, you can vote with something else. To me, that's still keeping a prop with you the entire time. Um, okay. If the category does not call for a prop and you want to be extra and you want to be, you know, uh, ballroom about it, you could say, I would come out with a prop and then not battle with my tens. I've done that before. I've come okay. out with a prop. But the category didn't ask for a prop, so that's why I did the prop, only for the tens and for your entrance, you know, to get people more focused on you and what you're doing. Okay. Um, what is the difference between, between face category and face with performance, which you referred to before? But just give us the differences between the two. So face, as you know, is, is loveliness. You know, it's smiling, it's the skin, it's the structure. It's the hairline, the eyebrows, you know, um, teeth. Um, facial performance is more so having those qualities, but also being able to vogue around your face, face and serve your face. Um, but the hand movement. More so performance, you should be voguing. You definitely okay. need to vogue around your face, accenting your face. It's all about your face. When I teach facial performance, I try to teach people that they should keep their hands I'm not sure if you can see me, but they should keep your hands should never go below your shoulders. Okay. Keep it about your face because your face is up here. That's what face of performance is, is actual voguing. And you can also dip. Um, some people, when they're selling face, they, they can do a little voguing and stuff like that. They do things like that. They can even fall into a dip if they want to when they're selling mm -hmm. face. Um, but from face, birth face of performance, right? So people, let's just say people are walking face. Back then, when Top Tip and Spin and Vogue was first came out, everybody was voguing. They were voguing when they walked face. They were voguing when they walked uh, models effect. They were voguing when they walked labels. Everybody was voguing because it was something new. Everybody wanted to do it. So when you're selling face, you're voguing, you're selling face, right? So the next thing you know, two people are going at it selling face and they're, they just start voguing and next thing you know, someone has a ball because that that scene was so hot the next person that throws a ball say hey i want to have a category called face of performance because at the last ball it was so good i want to see that again next thing you know they have the category another moment happens the next person that's throwing a ball says hey i want to have the same category and that and that's how the categories happen is based on who walks the categories and one thing about people i've learned is that people are very competitive so mm -hmm. let's, for example, because every category has had its chance, but it was the, ma the most anticipated category at a ball and then the lowest at a ball. And it's like when people realize that you're the only one walking a category, 
if they see you winning constantly, 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 someone's going to get sick of that and say, hey, I want to learn this category. I want to try to win this category. And the next thing you know, rivalries begin to happen. People begin to get interested. And depending on who walks and who is that spectacular or that crowd pleasing, that can draw other people to want to walk that category. Yeah, that's true. And... Ooh la la. So, difference between body and sex siren category. So, body is basically that. You, is your body. So, to me, if I saw somebody walking body, I would expect them to be chiseled. I would expect to see muscles. I would expect to see nice muscle tones and shapes. Um, I would expect to see nice looking skin. Um, you know, because your skin is a part of your body. I wouldn't want to see a bunch of sores on somebody's you know, walking body. Uh, sex siren, I, the same rule for the skin applies to me as well. You should have nice skin if you're walking sex siren. Um, freckles does not count, you know, that you can't fight freckles. But, um, you know, I'm, but you, you're also trying to show sex appeal in that. So if a person is walking body, to me, you're walking body, you're doing different body poses, and you're selling your body. You're, you're accenting your muscles. Somebody who's walking sex siren would be gyrating, maybe touching themselves, licking their lips, finger in the mouth, um, looking, you know, slanted at the person, that type of thing. It's about being sexy, but you don't want to be too vulgar in that. It's about okay. being sexy, not raunchy and nasty and X-rated. Nasty. <laughs> so, um... How and when did the lip sync category was introduced in the balls? So I haven't seen many lip sync categories in the ballroom scene. I have seen people do lip syncing in ballroom. Mm -hmm. But if the category itself, I would say it had to have started in the early 70s when balls was strictly for the female fit. Um, I believe that that's when it started. I, I can't, I don't have a definitive date, but I would definitely say it was in the early 70s because as we know, balls were basically focused for the female figures and the femme queens and drags. They yeah. were seeing that, so let's say in the early 70s. Oh, nice. So, uh, that, was, that was one of my favorite ones. Uh, realness category in 2020. Okay. Your opinion on gay men trying to dress and behave as if they were straight. And also for trans women to pass, I guess. So what's the question again? What's your opinion about realness today? I think that realness is the same as it's always been. Ballroom has, has started off with, with LGBTQs trying to be accepted by um, society as we see it, right? So I think that the realness category is has always been there. I think that we need the realness category, but I, I think it may need to be changed because I've seen some documentaries and I've seen some posts from people who feel that it's degrading um, or it can be... Um, as if we're bashing ourselves or, you know, trying to exude something else or exude a society of people who don't necessarily appreciate us. Um, yeah. But I, I think that when it comes to realness, that's each individual person's journey. You know, I, I, I really can't say, you know, I, I, I like the category, um, I really do, but I, I think if people want to see it evolve and no longer have the stigma of that negativity that it has or that uneasiness that it has with people, I think that we should work together to try to find a way to merge the two together to make it so that everybody is um, more into wanting to walk realness or um, interested in the category itself or does not feel um, as if they're trying to portray something or someone or a society of people who do not approve of them. Yeah. Um, so, labels category. 
Lame. Another question that I really like. Um, a voguing emerged from an underground scene who was not rich, who didn't have a lot of money. And how did we start embracing having money to spend on clothes as a way to celebrate the ballroom community? So when the label category, again, when Ball started out, we were trying to emulate what we saw on TV. So back in the yeah. 80s, the big thing to be was rich because you had TV yeah. shows like Dynasty and um, All My Children. Everybody had on these luxury gowns and these outfits and things. So from, again, like you said, people that didn't come from, um, a lot of people in the ballroom scene came from broken homes. So they didn't have these um, luxuries. So a lot of times they had to steal them. I personally know people who used to go out and take bricks and bash the windows of these establishments and steal the goods and then come to the ball and walk the ball the same way that you saw on Pose, on the TV show. That really did happen. It didn't happen in a museum the way that they said portrayed it because that's a television series, but things like that did happen. And back in the day, you know, if you couldn't break the glass, you would, you would go to the store and you would start stealing. You would put the stuff in your outfits and you would walk the balls because it, it made you feel as if you were somebody. We were all trying to be somebody. We didn't know yeah. what we were trying to be. We just wanted to be accepted. You know what I mean? So we went by what we saw on TV. And then some people who were smart enough said, hey, I can get labels, but I don't have to go that route. Maybe I'll go to school and get an education. This way I can get a good job. This way I can get labels that way. For example, the House of Milan. You know, we have people who are stylists in the fashion world today that are very, very influential. The House of Milan, or the, or the, the, the people in the House of Milan really started fashion, taking it mainstream when it came to ballroom. Like, they were stylists, so they were able to go into these showrooms and pull clothing. They, they they didn't have to go out and steal. So a lot of times when Milan's walked, it was like a big deal because they're like, how the hell are you able to get these these items? You know what I mean? But it's because there are there, there were people in the bar scene outside of Milan's as well who wanted to take their skills to another level. So they said, oh, instead of me being a criminal or doing things the um, unlawful way to get these labels, I'll do it the right way. Okay. Um, so going back to the technical, we need your tips, like give, give us three tips for people walking old way and three tips for people walking American runway. So three tips for walking old way would be the first one I would say is your hands are your weapons. So make sure you are always precision and beware of the pesky pinky. I always tell people when they're voguing, a lot of times when you vogue, your pinky goes off. It even happens to me sometimes, so you just gotta be aware of that pinky. Um, another thing that I would say is remember to pose. A lot of times people are voguing and they think that they have to keep voguing. I don't know what they're thinking with you. They just keep voguing, but you have to pose. Posing is the pause or comma in the sentence that you're trying to write. The dip itself is the period, the ending of the story that you're trying to tell. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would, that would be my second one. My third one would be to learn the basics and build signature moves and learn musicality. And when I say that, it's, a lot of times I see people when they're learning how to vogue, they're so focused on trying to stand out and to be unique that they're not remembering to do the basics when it comes to the old way. You should do the basics first. Build your, build your confidence in your basics and then build from there to expand from there. If you're constantly going out and you're a new voguer and you're constantly yeah. going out and you're trying to do th different things new, you're not doing anything familiar, it's going to be difficult for people to identify with you. It's, it's, it's almost like as if you're, you're branding. Your Vogue has to be your brand, right? So even with artists today, a lot of times they'll hear artists and they'll say, oh, this album sounds like the last album. Well, it should sound a little bit like the last album so that you can remember who this person is because every time someone comes out with new music that you've never heard, it takes us as individuals a while to get used to 
new things. So you have to slowly introduce people into, into those things. And it's a perfect exact, this is a perfect question because we just had a pop tip and spin challenge and I participated in it, but it just made me realize how much I've grown as a vulgar. When you see all of your clips back to back, you can see the progress in your growth. And this is a, it was a lesson for me to say, keep pushing because you never want to put a collage of work together where you look the same throughout the year because it doesn't show no growth. You know what I mean? You always want to grow. And so um, I, challenge, I challenge everybody who's listening, if you know how to vote, to do the Pop Dip and Spin Challenge. I think it's over. It's Pound Pop Dip and Spin Challenge. Um, my brother Tim Van Vin started it, and I just want to push it as far as I can because I think, again, we have nothing better to do, right? Spread love, spread knowledge, have fun through Pop Dip and Spin. Now, for the American <laughs> Runway, one of the things I would say would be to, when you're walking, make sure you're not stiff and make sure mm -hmm. you're like a robot. You want to have some swag to you. Um, the second thing I would say would be to make sure that your effects do not look like a costume or anything like that. You want to make sure that when you're walking all American runway, you look like an, a, a runway, a model. So, someone who's, if I took a picture of your outfit, it could be something that I see in a magazine or something that I've seen on the fashion on the fashion runway somewhere. Um, my third thing of advice would be to not show that you're nervous. You know, when you're mm. walking, you don't want to be nervous. You want to be mindful of your facial expressions. If you want to have a straight face, that's fine. If you want to focus on something, you can focus on something. But when you get towards the judges panel, the best thing you should do is look each judge in the eye because it shows that you're strong, it shows that you're confident. Eye contact is very, very important in anything that you do in ballroom, especially when it comes to a runway, especially when it comes to voguing. When you're voguing and you, and you look at the judge in their face, sometimes it can draw them into what you're doing and make you win over the other person. The same thing with, with All American Runway. If you have that attitude and that confidence and you're looking the judges in their eyes to say, I am the one, I am the one you need to pick, then you're on your way. So work on your base and keep pushing. For which one? For, okay. for all it, work on your basics, yes. Um, you want to also have musicality, you want to count, and you also yeah. want to be precision. It's very important to be precision. Your hands are your weapons. So you should be very mindful of what your hands are doing, the shapes that your hands are making. Perfect. Um, nom, 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 nom. And the last question for this group, and then we're running to the last group because it's my favorite. Uh, okay. Do people really have to hold the pose when the commentator says so, or is it okay to move around? No. You should hold your pose when the commentator says hold your pose. If I'm judging you, and the commentator says hold your pose, and you still, you feel that, you know, you did a pose and you wanted to go over the person, but the person got out of it, in time, and now you want to do something else, that's a point taken off for you, for me, when I'm judging. The commentator says, hold your pose for a reason, because when you're voguing and when you're walking these categories, let's, it's, it, it, you have to look at ballroom as if it's Hollywood and you're competing. So if you're in Hollywood and the photographers and the reporters are taking pictures of you, when it's time to hold your pose, that's when you're supposed to hold your most magnificent pose so that the photographers and that fans can take their pictures of you. If you're constantly wobbling, then to me, those are, those, are, those are little minimal points that I would take off if I was a judge. So yes. Okay. Hold the fucking pose. Hold the pose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last group is questions about the scene and the houses. Okay. The first question is, what are the different criteria each house, each house has when it comes to picking 007s, making them part of the house? Well, I, I cannot say which each house has because I'm not in different houses and everybody runs their houses differently. I could say for the House of Milan, the criteria that I have, I look for people that have talent. First thing is talent. After that, I look at you as a person. I, I try to get to know you as a person. 
are you easy to talk to? Do are are you withdrawn? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Do we get yeah. along? You know, you know, are, are you a troublemaker? You know, these are the things that I look for um, when I'm first looking for people to join the house. First thing is talent. Second thing is personality. There are there are times where I might want somebody to join the house in Milan and I'll talk to them and I'll get to know them and then I'll look at them or I'll look at the way that they do things and then I'll say to myself, mm, no, they're, they're not Milan material or this person's a troublemaker or okay. this person's a shit starter or, you know, this person is good, but they're just not Milan yet. They need a little more work, but I don't see the drive in them to go there. So I'm not going to bring them to the house because I don't want to bring them to the house and then they just sit here and not do anything, you know what I mean? So um, that's the criteria that I look for, is talent, a, a, a good people, and people who want to grow and understand what Milan is. Milan is about excellence. You know, we've always been a house that's about excellence. So if people that want to come to Milan want to be excellent in what they do, and they want to learn how to be excellent, and they want to learn the history of excellence, then I would say, reach out to somebody if, if you wanted to be in the house of Milan, you know, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, do you think that when it comes to a battle, the judges usually pick the winner based on the house's politics or based on performance and technique? I think a lot of times it can be on politics. I'm not going to lie. I've seen people pick people on politics. Um, there are times <clears throat> when people pick their friends. Um, but, but then there are also times where I've seen judges pick over their own house members. But I think as far as answering this question, honestly, from a majority aspect of what I've seen, I think that politics definitely plays a role in ballroom today. It really, okay. really does. Um, I think that we should try to do something about it, but I think politics go hand in hand with a lot of things. I think the way to beat politics is to have people on the panel who are not on the panel constantly. I think that's, mm. that's part of the problem. We have the same judges judging balls. They're judging the same people and they're picking the same winners. They're picking their friends. But if you have a variety of different judges at different balls, you might get different results because the people are not going to change. You know, it's the judges, you know. So I think that's how we could break that mold of people judging us fairly. And then sometimes you just have some people who are just going to, it depends on them. They may honestly think that there's some people that's going to say, look, I'm going to vote for my house member regardless. Yeah. For those people, you can't, I, I don't get mad at those people because I get what they're saying. And I also understand the people who say I pick over my house members. I get both sides of the story. You know what I mean? But from a, for, to answer the question, yes, I do think politics does play a role. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what can you do? So right. what is your opinion about being shady and how do you respond to shade? So shade in the ballroom scene has always been there, right? It's, it's, it's the ball machine is about making people know it. That's how Vogue battles began because I don't like you. And rather than punch you in your face, I'm going to Vogue and I'm going to make you look stupid in front of these people. Or instead of punching you in your face, I'm going to read you instead of getting physical, right? So ballroom has always been about shade. I think that shade is everywhere. It's, it's when you're auditioning for a Broadway play. It's when you're on the battlefield and you're playing soccer against another scene. It, it's shade everywhere. But um, when it comes to ballroom, I try to keep the shade on the ballroom floor. I try to keep it ballroom. Even when I beef with people, I try not to go low um, and talk about their personal lives or their homes and stuff. I, I try not to go there with people because to me, that's going below the blow. I mean, below the belt, you know what I mean? And shade, there are different levels of shade. When it comes to ballroom, yes, like something shady would be somebody's walking the old way and they see me and they say, yes, bitch, tonight me and you on the floor. And I'm like, okay, yes. And then after the battle, whoever won, we would walk to the other person and be like, yes, I got you. You know what I mean? That's shade, but to me, I might be mad if I lost, but I could walk away understanding that 
it's only ballroom shade and it's not personal. You know what I mean? I have always, like I said before, early on, I'm a protected person. So if you come at me very shady, depending on who you are and depending on where we are, I'm gonna try to have, the, I'm gonna try to take the, the upper road, the, the high class road to throw my shade back to you. But if I see that you keep coming for me, I'm gonna throw shade and hip a little bit as well. Like I'm gonna protect myself as well. I'm gonna protect my family as well. So I respond to shade. I try. I always try to take the higher rep route. I'll say that. But if I feel that the shade is turning into a bully situation, then it's going to be on and pop because I, I you know, <laughs> start confrontation, but I don't run from it either. You know, and I, again, I'm just just not overprotectiveness or what you want to whatever you want to call it. But you know, when it comes to ballroom, I think shade 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 is essential. It's essential. It keeps it keeps the juices flowing. You know what I mean? It's good to have people, you know, come to your house and you come back at their house and you know, but as long as you keep it on the on the ballroom floor and you don't get personal and you don't do things to people personally to try to hurt them or hurt their families, then keep it ballroom. I'm here for the shade. I you know, hey. I'm the, here for the shade. I'm here for the shade. The house of Milan has always been known as a shady house and it wasn't because we were shady individuals it's because the leader of our house was shady but at the time we had so much attitude when we hit the floor and we would usually win when we hit the floor people just assumed that we were shady because we stayed to ourselves we would walk the balls we would win the balls and we would take our pictures and we would hang, hang out with each other and then we would leave and then people saying oh they're shady. but no, we're not shaking, we're just alive. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> okay, so um, what is your opinion about cultural appropriation in the ballroom scene and white vulgars, especially in the ballroom? So, how did it start and how has it changed the scene? So I believe that Willie Ninja was probably one of the influencers of taking Vogue international, right? I've all, I have the utmost respect for Willie. He was a good friend of mine. He looked up to me and that meant the bread to me. And sometimes people tell me that I'm really Willie Ninja and that just warms my heart to fulfill his legacy. But I believe that Willie Ninja was one of the first people to go abroad to teach Vogue and one of the challenges that I have with people in America is that some people feel that I shouldn't be going over and teaching abroad because um, they might look at it as people stealing our culture or things of that nature. But the reality is nobody owns ballroom, nobody owns the Vogue dance. The same way as breakdancing. You know, breakdancing started in America, but it's huge in Asia. I, I've seen it with my own eyes. So. I think that there's definitely a difference in the styles of voguing, right? Because I think that us in America, we came from a place where we had to struggle and we had to fight to be accepted. So my voguing and my story might come from a place of not having something to eat or having to be bullied when I was younger. So when I vogue, I release all that in my performance. Whereas somebody white or somebody from Europe who, does, who doesn't have that background, who doesn't have that struggle that we've gone through, may not be able to tell the same story because their story is different. And when you vogue, each, each, everybody's vogue is different. Everybody's telling a different story. That's why I said you have to learn the basics first before you can begin to tell your own story because if you don't, you have to, if you don't start from the beginning, how are people gonna understand what you're saying? when it comes to voguing, right? So I think that people in America, they get mad at me when I teach abroad because they feel as if people are, are gonna take what we've learned to enough, you know, and, and use it for their own or whatever. But again, nothing's documented here, right? And if you can't stop something, why not try to make, from my perspective, I can't stop people from learning how to vogue. But what I can do, I can spread the knowledge so that they do it the right way. I could, instead of me sitting back and doing nothing and just crossing my arms and being angry and saying, oh, they're stealing our this and they're stealing our that. No, I decided to get involved so that they know the right way to do things. You know, I try my best to 
to educate people as much as I can on how to do things the right way, but people want to walk away with their own understanding and do whatever they want. You know what I mean? So I think that that struggle is always going to be there because um, people people just feel that they're stealing. Same thing with, with music, right? People feel that um, people in Europe or, or white people are stealing R&B, that, you know, that type of thing. Those things are always going to be there, but if, if from a voguing perspective, if someone's there to fight that and to teach them how to do things the right way, I think that we can overcome it. But do I think it's going to go away? No, I don't think it's going to go away. I think people are still going to feel the way that they feel. Um, and I think and there are some people in, in Europe who are teaching and not giving the respect back to the, to the people who they learn from in America. That's one of the, another big problem that I have because, you know, I understand that there is no law over voting or there's no um, owner, per, well, Paris Decree was the owner. But I'm just saying, like, there's no, like, um, governance of voguing and things of that nature. So it is wrong when you're overseas and you're teaching and you're not giving people credit for the things that they do and you're trying to make it seem like as if you were the first or, you know, you're, you're doing, you're um, portraying this image as if, you know, you're so big in ballroom, but in reality, you're not. Now, I have a problem with that. If you're going to teach Vogue, be honest with people. Tell them you're teaching them Vogue because of which you learn how to Vogue. Don't tell them you're teaching them Vogue because you've, you know, you served at Vogue. Because there are a lot of people who are Voguing, who are teaching uh, Vogue, who can't win at a ball. And that's a problem. But if you're honest and you're saying that you're teaching from what you've learned and you're not um, trying to big yourself up as this big ballroom entity, then to me, I don't see a problem with it. Because again, I can't be everywhere. Jamal can't teach everybody. I, I can have online classes as much as I want. At the end of the day, people are still going to have that need. They need someone who's in their area to help them. You know, all I can do is just give you the steps or guide you in the right direction if, if I can't do it. But no one owns voguing. And I think you need to get out of that mentality. No one owns it. It's just that we, people like myself, people in ballroom who know the history of, of the old way and of voguing, it's our responsibility to make sure that people do it the right way. We have an accountability. We can't just sit back and just get upset and angry. What it, when people come to me and they say that, I always say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? How, how, how are you going to stop it? You know, and that's, again, there are a lot of people in America who, who don't approve of me going around the world and teaching people. But, you know, so that I say, how else do you stop it? If you don't help, how else do you stop it? You know, and if, again, my, my job in this world is to spread love and knowledge so that I can live forever. So that the way the way that Willie Ninja is living on through me, I want people to do that when I'm gone through me. You know, that's how we live forever. I'm I'm like I said, I when I talk about Willie Ninja, I always get so excited because he 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 believed in me it's so much. And the fact that people even look at me in his light humbles me so much because he he I'll never forget he told me when he was going to Europe he said, voguing is going to be all over the world. He said, I'm going to be the one to shed the light. And that, that, when people do things from their heart, it just resonates with me. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm a Libra. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it, it, just, it, just, it just resonates with me when people genuinely do things from their heart based on their talent. Or like when people sing or people can cook or people can draw. When they do things from their heart and they want to share with others, to me, I think that that's just amazing. So. That's how I feel about um, voguing as far as uh, whites voguing. I think that we are telling different stories, but I think that the way to bridge those gaps is for those white voguers to learn the basics and to do the basics, to show the respect. Because yeah. a lot of people look at it as disrespect. They're saying, ah, oh, you're doing voguing, you're doing it wrong, you're not even respecting us. And then some people are so used to seeing the old way done their way, they don't even like the original way. So, okay. you know, I've heard that there are people abroad who don't like the way the Americans vote the old way when we started it. They are so used to looking at old way the way that they've done it. You know what I mean? And that's what I don't want to happen because that's how you begin to lose the authenticity of categories by not spreading well, out. Uh, we have 20 seconds, so I'm going to ah. end this. And I'm going to open a new one, okay?
So everyone tune in to the next one because we have 10 seconds left. Just a moment. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> of course, we wouldn't make it, but we just had last one last question. Like, <laughs> we're so close. We try. <laughs> so, do you have anything else to add on the previous before we move on to the next one? Um, no, that's all I would say about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the last question is. The commercialization of voguing concerning artists that are not in the ballroom scene, such as performers, choreographers, singers that use voguing and their, at their shows and their video clips. Um, do you think that happens because people nowadays are more free when it comes to like the LGBT culture and their sexuality, or? Is it because they just like what they see? They copy the moves, but they don't know the history behind the moves, and they don't know about ballroom culture. I think that it's the latter. I think it's that. I think people like what they see. They they want to do it because all their friends are both now. I don't think that. Um, I don't think that straight America once really cares about our culture and our history. I don't think that. I think that when they see somebody voguing femme, I think it looks cute, or they see somebody voguing the old way, I think they think it looks cute, and they want to learn how to do it. But I don't think they take it the extra step to learn about our history, you know, and things of that nature. Um, I do think that when it comes to female artists. I think that they take the Vogue them aspect of it and they um, use it to exude their femininity. I think that it helps them um, become more feminine. I think that they take the, the moves that they do for Vogue Femme and they incorporate it in their um, femininity. I, I think that a lot of artists do it today. A lot of female artists do it today, including Beyonce. I, I think that it's done a lot by a lot of women. I think that when it comes to um, the the always side of it, I think that, like I said, people they like to see you vogue, but they're not gonna they're not gonna look into the history of always where it came from. You know, I think it's harder to vogue the always for a group of people because if you're not shablamming on the ground or giving people a reason to go like this, you know, they you have to do some type of moves to get the crowd to clap for you. I mean, if you're not voguing femme, it's, it's, and you can ask around. It's hard when you're voguing Ole in a vogue Ole. world. <laughs> As a performer, you know, for me, I get, I get my enthusiasm and my, and my moves off of the crowd a lot of times. So when you're voguing and the crowd is not clapping and you're an Ole person and you're like, well, damn, what do I got to do? Do I got to do a cartwheel? Do I got to stand on my head? What can I do? It's difficult because everyone is looking for you to go, you know what I'm saying? Everyone's looking for that, you know what I'm saying? And it's hard. It's really, really hard. So, yeah. That's okay. I want to, like, since we opened the second live, I'm going to keep you for five more minutes if I can. Yes, keep me, keep me, keep me. <laughs> Because none of the questions that I asked you were actually my questions. So I'm going to ask my question. I want you to give me your three favorite vloggers that are still active. For what? And that are not in the House of Milan. So what categories are we talking about? Whichever you want. Like the ones that you see and like you feel blessed by watching them vogue. Now are we talking new, old, or just anybody, period? Okay, let's go old way. No, I'm saying, are we talking about new people, older people, younger people, or? Oh, I would say people? the whichever. So for the old way, 
Hmm, not Milan's. People who I like to see. Okay, so for the old way, I like to see, well, in America, I like to see Brian Balenciaga. I mm -hmm. like to see, um, hmm, Brian, I like to see Jovan. I think he's about Maine now. I like to see, um, I like to see all the new kids. Like anybody new that's going the old way, I, I I love to see it. I mean, granted, you might not be the best at the moment, but to me, the fact that somebody new is walking the old way to me that just gives me life. But from regular people that I see, I, those are the two that just stand up for me automatically right now. When it comes to internationally, I have so many people that I love internationally. Like I have so many, so many, so many. Um, I love. Um, Alan, Omni, I love um, Serge, I love um, Daniel, I love, oh my God, so many people are coming to my, to my head. I'm trying to not think of Milan's, who? I love, <laughs> I love um, Samuel, Revlon, I love, um, Oh my God! It's so many people. Um, I think. It's <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna change the category. Okay. Okay, so I would like your three favorite uh, runway divas, walking European runway. Just three runway divas. Um, and you can you can have a middle on too, okay. but you you have to pick three. Okay, one. Well, runway divas. Well, I would definitely pick Amy Milan. Um, without a doubt. Um, they will all be Milan's. Okay, let me pick. <laughs> um, mm, top three. I like Japan Chanel. I love his runway. Um, and I also like um, Corey. No, is it Corey? I'm not sure where house Corey went to. I like Corey's walk as well. Okay. <laughs> Your face is everything. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you very, very much for all the advice and all the knowledge that you share with us. You're very, very good. It is. And I'm really oh, wait, hoping that this will end soon, and we're gonna hug each other and train together very soon. So, can you take questions from people in the bottom or no? Sure. Let's see, guys. If you have any questions, you can write them down. I'm gonna go through the comments. Okay. Um. Actually, you can have. Like there is a box with a question mark and you can write down your question over there. Mm. It's mostly hearts and people saying that they agree. <laughs> yeah, I can't see. This is fun. I've never done this before. So I'm like, I'm really, <laughs> this is like, wow. So cute. This is cool. Wait, I'm scrolling through. So this is going to be saved and we can watch this later and for Yeah, I already saved the previous one. Okay. Um, yum, yum, yum. Wait. Michael says that he's bored, so we should keep it going, but we need feedback. Oh, someone asked to, if they have any tips to be from being nervous. Oh, that's nice. So when I walk balls, I'm never, ever nervous. I'm always anxious. But, okay, so this is something I can say. So when you're going to walk balls, no matter what category you're going to walk, a word of advice I would give is to practice your tens and practice at least three battles so this way when you get to the ball let's just say for example it's a it's a it's a it's a long night and it's a lot of people walking 
at least you're walking into the competition or the fight because I think that ball is a big fight between how I look at it as a war. We're all going to war on the runway to see who's going to be the best, right? So if you're going to war, to me, you want to prepare for that, right? So to me, you would prepare for your tens, you prepare for at least three battles so that this way when you're walking the balls, what you do for your first battle, you don't do for your second battle, and you keep looking interesting to the judges. It's very important. People, when, when people, sometimes people think that um, things come to me easy because, oh, you've been voguing so long, Jamal, it just comes to you easy. No, I still practice every day. I practice all the time because even Michael Jordan, the greats, Beyonce, she practices her vocals every day. Just because you don't hear music from her does not mean she's sitting somewhere just quiet. She's practicing her vocals, trying to expand her skills. So I think that when people walk balls, I'm going to say it again, you should practice for your tens, and you should practice for at least three battles, at least three. And this goes for face. How you're going to sell your face for the first battle can be different how you sell it for the second battle. This goes for runway. Some moves and turns you do for runway, you can do differently each particular battle, even fashion categories. You say to yourself, I'm going to pull out the Balenciaga first. I'm going to have on the Moschino second. I'm going to have on the Gucci first. You got to, you know, there, there's a way to prepare for every battle that you're going into. I think if people are well prepared, not only will we see more um, exciting moments on the runway, we'll also see people grow in their craft as well. So Michael asks, could you clarify what a dip really is in the old way? Yes. So a dip in the old way is any time your head hits the ground. When your if this is the ground, when your head hits the ground, that's considered a dip. If you do something and your head is this far from the ground, that's a pose. It's not a dip. So your your head must touch the ground. Even when you do a layout in Vogue Film, they're head is touching the ground or they're you know it's giving the illusion that their head is touching the ground when they dip so a dip for me is anything with your head on the ground transgender who hasn't done the surgery can really walk the category of femme queen say it again transgender who hasn't done the surgery can really walk the category of femme queen Yes, so so you're talking about a trans that has not had the cop, the surgery to remove their um, private organs, right? Yeah. Yeah, they can walk. Um, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you guys have questions. Ask questions, guys. <laughs> Wait. Yum, yum, yum. I can't see anymore. No. Any tips for babies who just started doing this all the way? Yes. So, a tip that I would say, oh, there's another question and some other questions. So, a tip for a baby who doing this all the way, I would say is to learn to do the basics. Um, after you learn to do the basics, remember to count. And one, two, three, four, pose, 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 then vogue, 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 either a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or one, two. Always remember to count and always remember to pose and to be precision. Precision is very, very important. I cannot say that enough. I think that if people begin to be more precise in their voguing, that will keep the integrity and the authenticity of voguing. Okay, so we have some questions now. Yes. So, what was the first thought when you saw Butch Queens voguing like a femme queen? When I first saw that category, I laughed. I thought it was funny. Um, when that category first came out in 1992, um, between Vogue and like a femme queen, uh, a lot of people used to go to the bar. Or they used to walk, go to the bathroom. No one really, really paid attention because they thought it was almost like a joke. 
And then it wasn't until people started being really good in the category that made people pay attention to it more. So, you know, I, honestly, I'm going to be honest. When I first saw, when I saw Bogan, Between Bogan and the Pimp Queen, I was laughing at it. I thought it was funny because I was so used to being consistent. And then when I saw um, people like Eugene Milan, you know, he's one of the pioneers for Butch Green Gold Femme. You know, he was so good at it and he was so theatrical and he was so feminine with it. And he was so short and so tiny and had so much sass. I started wanting to watch it. And then you had people like Kevin Prodigy and then you had like Baby St. Cl like people started coming out. Like I said, when people realize one person is turning something, you're going to see other people start to come out with their own tricks and things of that nature. And when I saw that, it was like, it, for me, it takes about a good two or three people in a category for me to really like it. Like, if, if the category is only one person really dominating, I'm not, I'm going to be honest, yeah. I'm not really going to follow. But that takes time. It like, takes it time. takes time. And when something first begins, like, usually people are, like, skeptical about it. Right. Right. So, uh, in the face performance category, do the hands come from only old way? Like, I guess you could use, the, I mean, the, could you use hands from Vogue Femme, like hands performance? Or is it like framing the face like we do in the old way? You can, you can do all those things for face performance. Um, the idea is to accent your face. So, you can Vogue Femme around your face. Right? Yeah. Um, you can do uh, hands performance around your face. You know, you can do all those those moves that people do. It's it's basically curtailing all of your moves around your face and accenting your face. So even if your arm is extended, I'm not sure if you can see my arm extended. Even if your arm is extended, something is around your face. Even if my hand is in the air, there's something around my face. So if you can incorporate all of those moves and still accent your face, then it should be fine. Mm -hmm. But you can still okay. do, you know, feminine things around your face. You can play with it and stuff like that. Yeah, you can do that for sure. So we have a really nice question. In Italy, we're talking about how to include non-binary people in ballroom. Okay. Like creating new categories for them so they don't have to fit in gender labeled categories. What do you think? I think that it's a trial and error. So I think you should start small because, again, the way that the different categories came about in ballroom is that there are no rules, right? So if I want to have, if person A wants to have a ball and they want to have non binary categories, they can. If person B wants to have a ball and they don't want to have non-binary categories, they don't have to. If person C wants to have a ball and they went to person A's ball and they like the non-binary categories, they can have them too. So I, what I would say to people who are trying to um, create new categories for new genders, I would say to start small. So you have one or two categories first, see if you get... Uh, a good turnout from that and then when you have your next function you have it again or and then once you get a sm once you get like about five competitors then you can start being creative and, and branching out and slowly introducing new things to people so that people can slowly grow into what you're doing so yeah. i would say start off with like one or two categories and see how it works out and then go from there awesome um we have more hearts. How do you practice old way by yourself, apart from counting? So the way you practice is, I used to listen to this song called Bonus Beats. It's by Xavier Rosario. It's called, the song is called, You Used to Hold Me, Bonus Beats. It's about, it's like three minutes long. The song is nothing but beats. It's nothing but boom. Boom, 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 boom. From there, you can count. It's one, two, three, four. To learn how to count to vote, you should learn to beat that's just plain, a, a plain beat. I always tell people to go to that song because that song is three minutes long. And if you can vote in a chair three minutes long and, and 
That's how I built up my mood. Because if I'm sitting in a chair or if I'm looking in the mirror for three minutes, that's a long time. And I'm saying to myself, don't repeat. Think of new moves. Challenging myself constantly, constantly. And when you constantly do that, with practice, you get better, right? So if you're constantly practicing three minutes straight, just boom, 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 boom. That's how you begin to count. Make sense? <laughs> Maybe. So, um, wait, wait. I understand what you said, that we should know the basics and not lose the authenticity. But are there things in Europe, in the European scene that you really liked? Are there? Th I guess that since the European scene is not the original. Oh, yeah. I love the fact that I, I, one thing I do love about the Europeans is the dips. Like, you guys are so creative with your dip. Um, I love it to the fact that, you know, a lot of times before I started dipping again, because at one point I got sick and tired of dipping on my neck, right? So <laughs> I started dipping on the side and I started trying to be creative and trying to find dips on the side of my head so that I'm not putting that much force on my neck or on my shoulders. So I'm a fan of doing dips on the side. I, I love doing dips. And one thing about Europeans, they the dip that they come up with on the side and the way that they hold their legs, I love it. The same thing with Asians. Like, the way that they dip is just so different from Americans, and I love, love, love to see, see them dips. That's why I always say, when it comes to European vulgars, once Europe gets the precision down pack, and not, not Europe, once once just Amer um, the world abroad, I think it's just, I, I think it's, a broad statement to say it's a, it's an abroad thing. It's not a European thing. I think that once they get the precision piece of voguing down with the dips that they have and they get the musicality and they start learning how to tell a story and how to tell a story with your vogue to somebody, once that comes, it's going to be like 1988 again. I just, I just see it. But people have to get there. They have to learn. They have to learn the right way. You have to, it's all about precision. If anybody's teaching you the old way and they're telling you not to be precision, in my opinion, they're teaching you the wrong way because it should be precision. Your hands are your weapons. It was, voguing started off as a fight. Even if you're voguing femme, it's a fight. You're fighting to see who's the better dancer because you don't want to attack each other. That's why when, when the femme queen used to vogue, it was a cat fight. Because they're they're both they're they're fighting each other but not touching each other, and you're trying to see from a from a feminine perspective, you're trying to see who's more of a woman, who's more of a woman than the other person. From a masculine all way perception, I'm trying to show you that I can make you look silly, and I'm the best. That's yeah. what I'm looking at in my mind when I'm when I'm battling. So. When I'm alone, I just get in front of the mirror and I just start voguing. And sometimes I might have a cocktail or two. <laughs> there are times when I'm in my house and I'm voguing. Sometimes the beats, you know, I got some beats from Angel X. Shout out to DJ Angel X. He gave me some beats. And sometimes I'll hear a beat and it'll make me do something that I've never done before. And I'll say to myself, wow, I got to put this in my arsenal. And sometimes I'll write it down or sometimes I'll do the move and I'll record myself yeah. the move so that I can remember it for my next LSS or something like that. So that's why when people say, it seems like you know what you're going to do. Sometimes when I'm doing my LSS, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I just know I'm going to do certain moves. But because... You got to think about it. When people are walking these balls, a lot of times they don't know what the DJ is going to play. You don't know what the DJ is going to play. So the more you listen to different types of music, the more you listen to, the more that you try to vogue to all types of music, makes you a yeah. vogue. If you can find that steady beat. Every song has a steady beat. Every song has a steady beat. If you find that steady beat, that's how you learn how to count. That's how you learn to be a fantastic voguer. You can vogue to anything. I can vote to classical music. I can vote to the wind vote. I can vote to somebody whistling. Like there are a lot of things <laughs> I can do that I don't do, but I love to see other people do it because to me, to be the best, you should be able to, when the when music comes on, if you're a good voter, you should be able to vote to it. 
if it's Taylor Swift down to a clubhouse song, you should be able yeah. to go to it. Even if it's ballet, from ballet down to Spanish music, you should be able to vote to it. To the Star Spangled Banner, you should be able to vote to it. Because voguing is musicality. It's all, it's all musicality to me. So when I hear a beat, I can go boom, boom. I can hear a cymbal, and the cymbal makes you want to do this. I can hear a <laughs> and it makes you want to go <laughs> You know, you, you listen to little things in music, and you use your imagination to pull it out and express that with your body. Yes. Okay. So, um, I see a long question there. I think Daniel asked something about freezes, but I lost it. Yeah. When you were talking about the dips, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if it was about the season in Old Way or the dips in the European scene, if you were talking about freezing, the freezes. Yes, the freezes. So, um, freezing, I think Daniel was talking about freezing is the same as dipping. Because I think um, freezing comes from the term of a break of a, a b boy, um, so I think the freezing is what he's cons considering to be dipping. Yeah, I'm talking about the same thing. So, Michael, uh, could you name five names in old way from the old school days that people could watch and study? No Milans. No Milans. So. The only problem with I'm writing down. <laughs> the only problem with things like that is that a lot of people back in the day didn't transform their historical documents onto social media. So it's a lot it's difficult to find people sometimes. Um, and like for example, you can look up Ronald LeMay. He's somebody who I would definitely suggest. But if you look up Ronald LeMay today, you're probably going to find the same videos that have been out there for years. It's, it's going to take people to actually do research and to reach out to people um, who are older in the scene to see if they have any footage, any video footage or VHS tapes to look for these people. But I'm going to give you the names. One of them is Ronald LeMay, for sure. Um, another person to look out for is definitely Derek LaVeja. Um, he's another person. Another person to look for, and that's Derek, I believe, D-E-R-R-I-C-K. Um, the third person would be, um, I'm going to say Jason Ovenus. And the way you spell Ovenus is O-V-A-H-N-E-S. You might be able to find stuff from him. Um, and... Another person, I'm going to say Jerome Pendarvis, but you're not going to find anything on Jerome Pendarvis because I've looked. Um, <laughs> like I said, it, it would have to be, like there are a lot of people in the scene that have um, elders in their house or elder people in the ballroom scene that they know that has a houseload of VHS tapes or a houseload of DVD tapes that they're, they're just sitting on. And to me, and I had to tell this to one of my elders um, a couple of years ago, you know, when you die, that information dies with you. And I understand that people don't want to share because they feel that, you know, people are going to steal their all culture and things of that nature. But you can't steal what has already happened for me. Yeah. So I believe that you're doing a disservice to people like you guys or people who want to know the history of ballroom or categories of people when you have these artifacts in your possession and you don't share them with the world because once you go, they go, you know? So I think a lot of icons and legends in the ballroom scene, if they're listening to this or if they go back and listen to this, it's your responsibility. If our history gets lost, it's because of you. It's because of people like you who are not sharing the history and when I say share the history, I don't mean just post the video. Post the video and tell us who these people are. Tell us what these people did. Because from if I'm a new person and you give me a video, you say, this is an old school video, I'm going to look at it. I'm, I'm just going to look at it. I'm not going to look at it to learn. I'm going to look at it to look at it. But if you're narrating or you're giving me information as to who's who in the video, then it might draw my attention more. Then the information might sink into me more. You know, so 
again, I just, I just think that ballroom could be saved and the history of ballroom could be saved and people would know their history if they had avenues to go out and look for the history. A lot of people in ballroom say, well, they should know who I am. They should know my history. I'm X, Y, and Z. Well, have you Googled yourself? Because if you have and you don't find anything, how is anybody else going to find something? Or have you uploaded <laughs> your, your moments that you have in your cabinet on your, in your fireplace or in your wall unit? If you haven't uploaded them, how is anybody going to properly know what you've done? We can't constantly by what we say and flap our gums because people lie. You really find out the truth in people when they have to write down their history and when people can look at it for years and years to come and somebody can say, oh, no, that's not true or that date is wrong or, you know, that's when you find out the authenticity and the who's really who when it comes to learning and, and their history. You know what I mean? So yeah. That's how I feel about it. So uh, when was your first time as a father and when did you choose a child in Europe? My first time as a father was mm, in the 90s. My first son was Christian Milan. He passed away, but he was um, he was also my best friend, one of my best friends. And he walked face. He was gorgeous. Um, and when was the first time? My first child in internationally is would be who was my first? Um, I'm thinking, is it David? I think it might be David. I think David might be my first. But I have international kids that are not in the ballroom scene either. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm taking a, a while to, to answer because I have kids that are not in the ballroom scene. But from a ballroom perspective, David would be the first. Uh, well, he's actually Bambi. Hold on. Um, and my baby would be um, Agan. He's in Taiwan. Yeah, he's the youngest. Well, the youngest as far as my lineage of kids. He's the baby. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion about cis straight males and females in the ballroom scene? Do you believe that they're accepted? I guess we should uh, focus on straight because we already talked about uh, cis women walking. So we're talking about trans men? Mm -hmm. We're talking about trans men? Straight. Oh, straight men. Oh, so what I feel about straight men walking gay balls? Yeah. <laughs> well, straight people have always walked balls. I think people need to understand that. Um, a lot of times they were snuck in by people. But straight people have always walked balls. Um, when it comes to, I think it would be ridiculous for a straight man to walk realness. Because the reason for realness is because the gay man is trying to be the straight man. Although I don't know yeah. that some straight men would really have their wig snatched if they walk realness against some people, because some people <laughs> are more real than the, than the straight men today. So, um, but I think that that would be a dumb category for them to walk. Just like I think it would be a, a dumb category for a woman to walk them cream realness. Although there are some femme queens that look realer, that would snatch some women's wig, you know. But, um, <laughs> what was your question again? Did I answer it? Or but like, should should they walk? Is is it, is it acceptable that they participate in the women's scene? I wouldn't be against it. Um, I think straight people can walk. Yes, I think it becomes a problem when. To me, I, me, I would prefer if straight people walk categories like performance um, and maybe face. When you start coming into sex diagram and things of that nature, to me, if you're a straight person, like if you're a straight man and I know that you're straight, how much fun are you really going to get out of what you're doing? Like, if you're a straight person, like, if you're walking sex iron as a straight person, how, like, how much fun are you 
I, I mean, I guess they, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one there. <laughs> but I know that there are a lot of women that walk bald. But when it comes to men, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a double edged sword. I think people look at things differently. And because I know for, I'm sure there are a lot of women that walk with women's performance that are straight. I'm sure that there are a lot of women that walk sex siren that are straight. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't have male figure sex siren where the man's going to be straight because I can't see a man wanting to have a bunch of gay people, you know, fawn over their body. I can't see that from a straight man. A woman, you know, I can see that from a woman's perspective. But um, so then the, that raises the question to say, well, is it more acceptable for women, straight women to walk than straight men to walk? You could open up that can of worms, right? Yeah. So for me, I don't have a problem with straight people walking as long as they identify as straight. Like, don't try to fool me. Don't try to fool me that you're gay and you're really not. Like, if you're, if you're a straight person, say you're straight, let it be known that you're straight. Like, don't try to fool us. To me, that's a little bit deceiving when you try to do that because people have done that in the past. Had people walk. I'm sure you've heard about the big scandal in America with the girl that is a real woman and she was walking femme queen categories. Oh no, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's a big scandal in America that was just uncovered not too long ago. So, you know, I thought that was where your question came from because that happened in America. So that's why I thought you were going with that, asking about straight people. But as far as straights are concerned, yeah. I think they can walk. I don't think it should be a whole bunch of categories. Like straight people walk in the old way and that type of like, at the, because at what point is it, or is it no longer going to be the LGBTQ community? At what point? You know what I mean? Like, this is our community, first and foremost. We are opening it up to straight people. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's our community first. Um, the same way straight people feel about their community. They don't want gays in certain arenas, or they want, you know, a certain percentage of gays, or what have you. You know, there are people in the ballroom scene that feel the same way. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I see somebody say something. Then thank you so much for answering everything. <laughs> I see somebody say something about you whacking. Wait. Um, whoop. Now I'm typing for some reason. Uh, for the female figures, who could we watch when it comes to old women? For the female figure, that's a very good question. So Europe has the highest um, amount of female figure participants for the old way. So as far as from an American perspective, you're not going to find many people that walk it. There is, um, mm, you, you can look at Monique Ebony. She walks, um, she's a woman. She walks women's, she's a uh, woman's performance. Um, but she can do the old way. She can do both films. Like she can do it all. Um, you can look at her. She's Monique Robinson on my Facebook page. If you, uh... I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah. um, but from a female perspective, of course, there's always Leah uh, Richards. You can always look up Leah. But I'm not sure how much old school footage she has. Um, mm -hmm. From a European perspective. You can look at girls like Carolyn. Um, she used to be in the house of Omni. You can look at Rosa. She's in the house of Ninja. There are a lot of, um, like I said, there are a lot of women in Europe or abroad that are better at the category than it is in America. So there's not really a lot of American footage that you can get there. OK. So Yanu asks, from what I've heard from Muhammad Omni, Wacking was part of ballroom back in the day. Say it again. Muhammad Omni, Wacking was part of ballroom back in the day. They're asking me if Wacking was part of the ballroom back in the day. I've never seen anybody whack in ballroom my entire life. Um, maybe they were doing it in the clubs. But I've never mm -hmm. been a category. Now, don't get me wrong. There were categories where you had to be a dancer. But um, there were like dance categories. It was not specific to rap. 
Yeah. Do I think that people incorporate whacking in their vogue? It's possible. It's possible that they have incorporated whacking in their vogue, but I think a lot of people incorporate a lot of things in their vogue. Um, like you can put ballet in your vogue, but it's just a matter of bringing it back to the authenticity of what you're doing. I see somebody wrote something down there. And Yanu says, I said Mohammed told me it was part of, and he showed him some footages. Of, of whacking being a part of yeah. it's, it, it, it could be true. I've never seen it. You know, just because I've okay. never seen it doesn't mean it never happened. You know, but if, if that footage is out there, that footage should be posted. You know, this is the perfect example of what we're talking about. You know, if something yeah. like that footage there, because otherwise it becomes a word of, word of mouth situation. And then after a while, it gets lost. So if Yano could reach out to Muhammad to share that footage, that'll be good. So that, that could be a talking point that we can have to talk about. And can I ask you something? What do you think is the, um, like, relationship? I'm not sure if that's the correct word, but between whacking and voguing. Because many people who are not familiar with any of these two, they think it's the same thing. Well, it's not. But do you see any like ways that they have exchanged in the past, like back in the days? Say that one more time. In which ways whacking and voguing have exchanged like information and the dancers between them back in the days? Well, I had a conversation with a friend of mine when I was in um, Asia. We were talking about this and. Whacking and voguing, they were being done around about the same time, but one was on the West Coast and one was on the East Coast. Um, so the way that they were merged was, I believe, in, in interpretation. Like, I believe that whacking, they began to look at how the guys were whacking in America, and they took some of the moves from voguing, and I think that voguing did the same thing. They looked at what they were doing with whacking, and they took some of the moves because they started around about the same time. So they were both, um, I guess, cousins when it comes to the whole yeah. dance world, you know? So have people incorporated whacking and voguing? Yeah, I don't see the problem in it, but your hands are your weapons. I'm not going to ever stray from that. You have to be precise. And which is whacking is more of a, you know, more of a moving your hands that way. Voguing is not that, but you can still, you know, move your hands and your wrists in a way that could be kind of sort of like whacking them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And Michael says, there is footage on YouTube when Willie used whacking in performances in the early 80s in New York. Yeah, I think uh, Willie did uh, a whacking move in a video he did. Um, I don't remember the Vogue video. Coming to the house. I, I forgot the name of the song. Uh, Elements of Vogue? I, I don't remember the name of the song, but Willie did do, he, in the video, you see him doing a move that could be um, taken from whacking for sure. Like, I, Willie was, he did a lot of dances, so I'm sure he probably did it. If, if someone told me that Willie Ninja did whacking, I'm not going to argue that because I believe that's possible. Okay. Um, checking if you have any questions. Come on, come on, questions, questions. <laughs> um, there's nothing new. No. Um, so is there anything else you want to share before we close? So before I go, I just want to say to everyone listening, especially to the people in Greece and ballroom, is that you guys are new. Enjoy it be outgoing, try as many categories as you can. I've always yeah. said that ballroom should be fun. I think the baddest bitch is the bitch that can walk out the ball with the most trophies. So <laughs> the most trophies I've ever left the ball with was three. And you couldn't tell me nothing after that. I think ballroom <laughs> is all about versatility. Because your scene is new, you guys have a chance to grow and you also have a chance to do things the right way. Um, like I said, I'm going to be here for you guys. If people in Greece, they want to hit me up on a... People in Greece, I already talk to different people on a one-on-one -on -one as it is. 
But if anybody new is listening to this and they want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me. I'll help you. Um, I don't get into the whole, you're not my in my house. I can't help you. I don't get into that. Of course, if it comes down to you battling my house member, it's Milan. But when it comes to giving advice and when it comes to helping other people, I'm always here to help people. People send me videos of their categories all the time who are not in my house, and I give them advice. So I'm just here to spread love for you guys, and I just want Greece to know that you have my support. I'll try to support you guys in a lot of your initiatives. I'll try to get you to come out to Greece to help build your ballroom scene so that it can be a, a thriving one like the rest of our community. Thank I you so much. Thanks for welcoming me into their heart. Aww. You have a place here always, you know that. Yes, my love. We love you very much and thank you so, so much for sharing with us. And thanks everyone for all the comments and the feedback. Thank you so much. Yes, take care. Love you, Father. Bye bye. Love you.